A young couple takes a short vacation in a remote forest location in the hope of getting away from all the troubles of their daily lives. Now, this is no ordinary cabin in the woods story, because what they get is unexpected and way more than they bargain for when they hear the sound of a small child crying in the distance. Well, my dear friends, I'm delighted to uh, read another story by Black Friday's Witch, 13. I haven't read one by her for a while, and it is as brilliant as ever. So, you know what time it is. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. My wife, Anne, and I had always wanted children. Oh, I think the nostalgia wore off, though, after our fifth miscarriage. I wasn't prepared for the ways it had begun to wear on my wife. The deep depression and the small ways it had started to destroy our lives. Then we got the news. She was pregnant again over the summer. It offered us back a small glimmer of hope, and we tried to put our fears and anxieties to rest. We were excited, and yet still apprehensive, because of all that we'd endured in the past. The doctors had placed my wife on bed rest, and a special diet as well. We were so careful this time, and we seemed to walk on eggshells whenever anyone would ask us about it. We were frightened we would jinx our new blessings. She carried our child further than she ever had with the other pregnancies. Then, around the end of the sixth month, my wife said she didn't feel well, and she needed to go to the hospital. She felt that something was wrong, even though we just visited the doctor the day before, and everything had been fine. That's when the doctor discovered that there was no longer a heartbeat. Sadly, my wife had to give birth to a stillborn child. It was more devastating than all the others that had come before. You see, this time, she was able to hold our little girl. We had a small ceremony for our child and buried her. Anne gave her the name of her grandmother, Emily, because she'd been so close to her grandmother when she was a little girl until she'd passed away. We had made the quiet decision that we would stop trying to become parents and that perhaps it just wasn't in the cards for either of us. We decided that maybe we'd investigate the possibility of adoption when the time was right. But right now, my wife's mental and emotional health was in bad shape. I decided to take her on a nice trip, about three hours away, to a quiet cabin in the woods overlooking a national park. When I'd found the cottage online, it was pristine with all its quaintness. It had two bedrooms, one bath, a large wraparound deck and a hot tub. The kitchen had an old-fashioned stove and the cabin itself had been refurbished to its original state using original wood and stone. It was beautiful, complete with flower boxes and all the windows, with little purple and white flowers that seemed to enhance the fairy tale aspect of the cabin. The day we arrived, I met Sam, the owner of the cabin, where we were lined up for our little retreat. Sam looked like some character you would find in a movie. He wore a flannel jacket and dirty blue jeans. He had a gun swung over his shoulder and a massive grey beard. Sam smiled and shook my hand when we met. He had a little girl with him, his granddaughter, Amanda. She smiled up at my wife, Anne, who smiled back at her. Hello, I'm Elliot. My wife, Anne, and I are looking forward to spending the week here. It's a gorgeous little cottage. I looked around, and the woods surrounding the cottage had a field of green grass in between them, and a little trail leading deeper into the forest. It was going to be a much-needed quiet place. Thanks. My late wife, Emma, and I restored it to its glory, and it was always her dream to have it ready for us. It's just that, well, Emma passed away five years ago, and I can't bear to be alone without her out here. I'm sure you can imagine, Sam said, looking at me and then staring at Anne. Anne seemed very empathetic to Sam, and nodded in understanding. Now I only have my son and my granddaughter here to keep me company, he said, patting Amanda on the head. 
She sat down on our front steps and was slowly turning the pages of her book. What are you reading? Anne asked Amanda, kneeling beside her. It's a book about the forest here, she said matter-of-factly. Oh, are there a lot of stories about this place? Anne asked, amused. Just the one about the birds that live in the forest. She then started to laugh. Oh, what kind of birds? Anne asked. Oh, scary birds that have red eyes. She giggled again. Sam looked at me and rolled his eyes. She has an overly active imagination. I imagine she gets it from all these silly fairy tale books her grandma passed down to her. We two have known loss, and that's what brought us here. <laughs> Needed an escape, Anne said, looking at Sam and then at Amanda with a gentle smile. Well, I think you'll find it to your liking. There's a landline phone because you won't get a signal out here with your cell. Your closest neighbor is about six miles away, and that's me. He chuckled a bit, as though he were embarrassed by that fact. I'm sure it'll be fine. I doubt you'll hear anything from us this week, I said, looking at Sam. Well, you'll find everything you need in the cabin. But should you need anything else, you have my telephone number inside next to the phone. I hope you two will enjoy your stay. I smiled, and Anne stood up, wiping off some dust from her pants. Sam had decided it was time to go because Amanda was getting hungry. He left, and after he pulled away in the driveway, I noticed that Amanda had dropped her book. It was an old children's book titled The Stork Book. It had these elaborate illustrations of the bird dropping off babies to couples' home. I smiled, shaking my head, and walked back to the cabin. Oh, what a sweet old man, said Anne, as she watched the old man leave. Yes, he seems nice. Now, let's get the groceries before they go bad, and perhaps we can have a bite to eat. I'm famished. <laughs> You're always famished, Anne laughed. We got settled rather quickly after that, and as the day drew on, we explored the woods, and Anne took photos of the birds and little red foxes that we were able to see. She seemed quite happy, and it was nice to see her smile again. It seemed to get darker in the woods faster than anywhere else. Even the birds seemed to stop chirping earlier than in the city. The forest took on a life of its own, and soon it was dark out. We went inside, and I made a fire in the little fireplace. Anne and I chatted for a bit over a couple of glasses of wine, and then we retreated to our beds a few hours later. I woke up early and noticed that Anne was gone. I was startled by this as I was usually the one out of bed long before Anne. She liked to sleep in, and just for a second I became concerned. I went into the kitchen, and to my relief, I saw her sitting with the front door open, drinking coffee and watching the forest. Morning, I said, kissing her on the cheek. Oh, good morning. I made coffee if you want some. Oh, I'd love some, I said to her, as I went back inside to make my own. So... You're up early, I said, looking at her with a sly grin. I couldn't sleep, so I thought I'd get up and make coffee. I nodded, and we chatted about other things while I looked at my phone trying to find the news, but the damn thing wasn't getting any signal. Well, old Sam had warned us, so I noticed we had a newspaper on the front porch. I stood up and picked it up. Gift from Sam? I asked, holding up the paper. Well, he did say it was quiet here with little modern technology. Well, I guess the newspaper is the only entertainment. <laughs> I could think of other things, I said, winking. Later that day, we spent most of our time exploring the wooded area behind the cabin. Anne took photographs of the trees and the little stream behind the cottage. It seemed to relax her. However, after snapping one of her pictures... She had this strange look on her face. She held up her digital camera for me to see, and I looked at the photo she'd just taken. What is that shadow? You can't see it with the naked eye, but here it is, clear as day. Sure enough, there was something that appeared off to the side of one of the trees. I handed my worried wife her camera back and then smiled. Oh, it's nothing to worry about. It's 
so odd, Elliot. Can you tell what it is? It almost looks like the shape of a man with a large bird wing. Oh, I can't tell, she said, putting her camera up to her eye and then taking another shot. Come on, Anne. Let's go get some grub. I tried to navigate her away from where we stood, because she had this worried look on her face. I was afraid she would snap back into a deep depression, and I didn't want this mysterious, shadowy figure to be the trigger. I began to hike back to our little cottage, and Anne seemed to linger behind me. When we got back, I started to prepare the grill for some much-needed food. Anne helped me, but she seemed lost in a weird day. I studied her, and tried to make her smile, but even through it all, she seemed not quite herself. It got even worse as the night drew on. I woke up around 4am and found Anne missing from our bed. I got up, put on my glasses, and then went down to the hallway. When I reached the kitchen, the door was wide open, and there was Anne, just standing in front of the cabin. There she was, in her nightgown, as though she was searching for something. Anne! I yelled, but she stood there unmoved. I walked over and grabbed her by the shoulder. Elliot, do you hear that? Hear what? It's a baby crying, she said, as a fearful expression took over her face. She grew pale, and her brown eyes appeared black there under the moon that peeked out from above the trees above us. Oh, I don't hear it, Anne. Please, come back inside. I was getting worried now. I hoped that perhaps she was sleepwalking. I walked her back into the cabin and shut the door behind us. She sat on the sofa, and I lit a fire. I made her sit on the couch placed a blanket around her, and then made her some chamomile tea. I sat across from her, looking at her as she drank the tea, trying to figure out if she was okay, or merely just tired. I want to go back to bed now, she said, getting up and handing me the cup of tea. Okay, let's go, I said, helping her up off the sofa and walking her gently into our bedroom. Elliot. Did you see the eyes? She asked as I covered her up. I looked at her and shook my head, my heart dropping a little. That night I had strange dreams where I got lost in the woods and it was pitch black out except for red eyes all over the forest staring at me. I woke in a sweat and found Anne laying beside me. I curled up around her, spooning her. I just wanted to hold on to her tightly, Anne, and I didn't understand why. It was as if I was afraid she would slip away from me forever. The next day, I talked Anne into going with me on another hike in the woods. It was an isolated area and had the feeling of serenity that we both needed. Even as serene as the scenery was, there was that aching feeling that something was off with Anne. She snapped photos again, as she had done the day before while we chatted. Then, as we approached a little creek bed, she stopped and looked up into the trees. What is it? I asked. Shh. Listen. Can you hear it? She asked me, almost gleefully. No, Anne, I can't, I said. Then I saw something move from above me. It took me off guard as I stood there hearing... What sounded like a crying baby? See? She asked, grabbing my arm as her wild eyes stared back at me, and she pursed her lips together. I listened, and I watched as something moved again. Something that looked as though it could be a massive bird, only I couldn't quite see it. I just saw a slight shadow, a movement near the top of the trees above us. It's a mockingbird or something, I sighed, grabbing her hand. She stormed away from me, picking up her backpack and stomped off through the thick grass and trees. Anne! 
I followed her as fast as my feet could carry me, but I tripped over a small log that seemed to come out of nowhere. When I looked back up, my wife was about 50 yards in front of me. I figured I would let her be and have a moment of alone time until I caught up with her. I was in no hurry for an argument. I could almost sense her slow detachment from me and the world around her. The pain we both felt from our loss was magnified in Anne tenfold. I knew better than to try and coax her out of the belief that what she heard was genuine. I'd let it slide for now, and maybe after a day or two, she'd realize it wasn't a baby crying in those woods after all. Only, when I got back to the cabin, she was already in the shower, and I figured I would make her some dinner while I waited. She didn't come out for a long while, and when I knocked on the bathroom door, there was no answer. I slowly opened it and tried to peer in, but there was so much steam coming out of the shower, I could barely see her. Anne, is everything okay? I asked, peeking around the shower curtain. As soon as I saw her, I knew that everything was far from okay. She sat with her knees up to her chest on the floor of the shower, sobbing. I turned off the water and wrapped a towel around my wife and just held her there for a long while. <laughs> she is out there, Anne sobbed into my shoulder. No, Anne, she isn't, I said, referring to our daughter who had come and gone too quickly from our lives. But... We can try again, or maybe finally talk to an agency to adopt. I tried to sound as gentle with my voice as I could, because she was so fragile. I was afraid she would permanently break. No, the other one. She is out there. I looked at my wife, and I knew then something had already broken. I had no idea how to fix it or even how to help. I picked Anne up and took her to our bed, covering up and letting her relax a bit while I made her some more tea. I shut the door to the bedroom, and I began to sob uncontrollably. How on earth was I going to help my wife when I was as depressed as she was? I'd been trying to hold it together until that moment, seeing her there so helpless. I wish then that someone or something could carry this pain away from both of us and bring us what we so desperately needed. Well, there is one thing about wishful thinking. Sometimes you may get it. Once things had calmed down a bit, I let Anne go to sleep, and then I cleaned up the kitchen and sat in the recliner. I read a bit, and then, after some time had passed, I fell asleep in the chair. I dreamt strange dreams, and the last thing I recall before getting awoken from a bitter chill in the air was a dark figure standing in the darkness of the woods, just glaring back at me with deep red eyes. The full moon above the trees cast strange shadows over its features. It was tall, at least eight feet, with glowing red eyes that changed to black, then back to red depending on the angle it moved from its massive head. I found myself walking toward it, as it dropped something from what appeared to be a long beak, gently to the ground at my feet. When I looked at it again, it merely flapped large wings that came out of nowhere and flew up into the sky. I was suddenly aware I was only dreaming, but I just stood watching it in my dream, and holding my arms as I shivered there in the darkness. Something jolted my body awake, and then I looked around the living room. The door to the cabin was wide open, and I shut it. Then it dawned on me. Where was Anne? I went into the bedroom as quickly as I could, only to find her gone. Her bed wasn't touched, and her slippers were still next to her bed. In a panic, I ran into the kitchen and then back outside. I ran as fast as my feet could carry me. Anne! I screamed her name loudly and waited for her to respond. 
That was the last time I saw my wife. Both the police and park officials completed a search. After days, it was determined she was just a casualty of the forest. People got lost all the time in those woods and never found their way back again. Couldn't bear to think of my wife gone forever. I stayed for another month at the cabin. Sam was kind enough to let me stay for free, no less. I kept dreaming I would find her, and each time I did, she would tell me, I found her. I found her. After that last month, I decided that it was time to go back home. I don't know why. But that cabin kept me there in its grip. It was as though I was needed there longer. Part of me wanted to stay for Anne, and the other part of me wanted to leave and forget about all the pain and all the loss. I had my bags packed and ready to go the night before, as I'd planned to leave at daybreak. Sam and his granddaughter, Amanda, had come to see me off. Sam had become something of a friend to me during the incident of Anne going missing. We stood and chatted for a bit about the fact that he would be here if I ever needed anything, and I thanked him for all he and his family had done for me. The next morning, I awoke around five or so, showered and dressed like a zombie. I had my bags in my hands as I opened the door of the cabin, and then I stopped dead. I nearly fell over from shock, and from almost tripping over something lying on the porch. I looked down, and my eyes were trying to focus on what was beneath my feet. It was a baby, wrapped in a white blanket. I picked the child up and looked around, but there was no one around the cabin. It was still chilly from the night air, and so I quickly brought the child into the cabin, shutting the door. I looked around the back of the cabin to see if I could see anyone leaving, but there was no one out there. I immediately called Sam and we called the police. It was another mystery that would go unsolved, much like Anne's disappearance. They tried to find the parents of the baby girl, but after some time, she became a ward of the state. That's when I decided to adopt her. I had this feeling it would be what Anne would have wanted me to do in this situation. I can't explain it, but I've always felt that the disappearance of my wife was connected to the baby, whom I named Emily. I really can't explain it, but there's a part of me that knows Anne somehow sacrificed herself for this child. It's my gut feeling, and that dream I had of that bird... Could that have been the stork bringing my child to me? I'd always thought it was just a story you told your kids so that you didn't have to explain sex before they were old enough to understand. Oh, as I sit here in my chair, typing this, I can't help but wonder if it was some old fairy tale based on fact. I wondered for a long while if there was a reason we'd gone to that cabin and not somewhere else. Well, Emily is going on eight now, and we live a beautiful, quiet life together. She's in school, has many friends, and I feel in some odd way that she is a gift. Perhaps a gift from Anne, or from somewhere beyond my understanding. Yet, Emily is here, and she is my daughter. Another brilliant story there shared at Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up for you to share your stories directly with me so that I could read them with my lovely audience. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that one. I thought that was great. Comments below the video
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?